Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our journey now through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now in Song of Myself to passage number 35, another historical narrative just like passage 34 that we just finished. Now, let's begin by reminding ourselves of a line that we use often in 303. We are the stories that we tell, where the stories we retell were also the stories that we decide to accept or to reject. And with that in mind, I think it makes sense for us to consider now this little poem as being one of those stories that we get to decide whether we accept or reject. Of course, we have to know the story first. The other thing I want to ask again, is, as, I, as I asked in our previous lecture, is there such a thing uh, as cultural or a collective theodicy? the last of our big five as we've spoken about them before. In other words, bad things happen to a group of people. Can we define those in some positive kind of way? Now we are in sections 26 through 38, what we have called a song of myself, what we have called the poet's microscopic vision moving from the ordinary to the mystical. And in sections 34, 35, and 36 here, of course, working 35, we're going to identify with Whitman American history and the celebration of American history, this time a sea battle happening off the coast of Britain. And as well, of course, Whitman's theodicy is somehow wrapped up in these stories, as we'll try to explain. Uh, just to remind, our key line from Song of Myself from Passage 4 is, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it, I witness and wait. Now that witness uh, is going to play strongly here. We're going to have Whitman re rehearsing a story that he had both heard and read about um, and, and, um, from, or from his youth, all right? Now, just, uh, just to remind, at LearnStrong.net, if you haven't been following our stuff, I hope that you will go there, find that Talks with Walt link down the left-hand side. We've already done the 24 poems of inscriptions, the 19 sections of Pomenoc, and the last 34 poems of Song of Myself, and now we're ready for this uh, second historical narrative. Now, our Norton's anthology will help us a little bit with the note here, uh, starting right away with the very first line of this poem, that in the deathbed edition reads, would you hear of an old-time sea fight? The, uh, the original line said, did you read in the sea books of the old-fashioned frigate fight? Um, it, the line, as, as edited, first appeared in the 1867 edition. In the three earlier editions, the poet had asked, as I read, did you read in the sea books of the old-fashioned frigate fight? Actually, his sources were both the tales told him by his maternal grandmother, Naomi Van Vulsor, his father, Captain John, uh, wh whose father, Captain John Williams, had served under John Paul Jones, the, the, the great Captain John Paul Jones, and the account by Jones himself, who wrote in a letter to Benjamin Franklin about the battle on the 23rd of September, 1779, off the British coast between his uh, Longham Richard, the, the name of his ship, and the British Cypress off of uh, Flambeau Head off the British coast. Um, and this letter printed in the Old South leaflets uh, is followed pretty much by Whitman with some uh, parallelism, some close parallelism. And quite a bit of research has been done about this uh, event itself. Now, of course, this is going to be one of those narratives that will celebrate John Paul Jones as one of the great captains, and yet he'll call him a little captain. It's fascinating. Also, final observation before we uh, read the poem. There is an interesting difference between the 55 version of this and the final deathbed edition version as it relates to tense. We'll talk about it. Would you hear of an old-time sea fight? Would you learn one by the light of the moon and stars? List to the yarn, as my grandmother's father, the sailor, told it to me. Our foe was no skulk in his ship, I tell you, said he. He was the surly English pluck, and there is no tougher or truer, and never was and never will be. Along the lowered eve he came, horribly raking us. We closed with him, the yards entangled, the cannon touched, my captain lashed fast with his own hands. We had received some 18-pound shots under the water. On our lower gun deck, two large pieces had burst at the first fire, killing all around and blowing up overhead. Fighting at sundown, fighting at dark, 10 o'clock at night, the full moon well up our leaks on the gain, and 
five feet of water reported. The master at arms loosing the prisoners confined in the afterhold to give them a chance for themselves. The transit to and from the magazine is now stopped by the sentinels. They see so many strange faces, they do not know whom to trust. Our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter, if our colors are struck and the fighting done. Now I laugh, content, for I hear the voice of my little captain. We have not struck, he composedly cries. We have just begun our part of the fighting. Only three guns are in use. One is directed by the captain himself against the enemy's main mast. Two well served with grape and canister silence his mustery and clear as dax. The tops alone second the fire of this little battery, especially the main top. They hold out bravely during the whole of the action. Not a moment cease. The leaks gain fast on the pumps. The fire eats toward the powder magazine. One of the pumps has been shot away. It's generally thought we're sinking. Serene stands the little captain. He's not hurried. His voice is neither high nor low. His eyes give more light to us than our battle lanterns. Toward twelve, there in the beams of the moon, they surrender to us. Now later, uh, we're going to uh, mess around with maybe Whitman's most famous poem, although he always hated that people considered it his most famous poem, Oh Captain, My Captain, where we're going to have another captain on the deck of a ship, and we'll reference or have echoes back to this passage when we arrive there, of course, his classic poem about the assassination of Lincoln. Now we'll begin, first of all, with the interesting would you hear, in other words, are you interested, and notice who is the you that he is referencing here, of an old-time sea fight, right? Now, of course, we're back here to battles, to fighting, to conflict resolution through violence. Would you learn who won by the light of the moon and the stars? And of course, we're going to be back to the light of the moon uh, by the end of this poem. And then, in a line that was not in the 55 edition, list to the yarn. It's interesting he calls it a yarn, right? As my grandmother's father, that is to say Naomi Van Belser, tells uh, 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 the, the words of the father, Captain John Williams, the sailor told it to me, and of course this battle of the 23rd of September 1779 in the American Revolutionary War. Now Whitman grew up steeped in the patriotic history of our country, as many of his brothers, several of his brothers, named after great Americans like Thomas Jefferson, and so Whitman is a true patriot. Now, we've made this argument before, we'll make it again, that if you as young people are not patriotic, that is not your fault. Because you're not born a patriot. You have to choose to be a patriot. If you're not a patriot, it is not your fault. It's our generation's, my generation's fault for not giving you the reasons to be patriotic. I think I say this in my, des in my discussions of the Declaration of Independence. You can find those at LearnStrong.net. Here, we're going to hear what, what for Whitman will be a true hero. Why? Because he stands in the face of the challenge, and, he is, and he's able to stand strong. Notice, we'll begin, though, with the English. Our fear was no skulk in his ship, I tell you, said he. By the way, this said he was not part of the original uh, 1855 version. He was the surly English pluck. And there's no tougher or truer. There never was, never will be. In other words, up against the greatest of odds. Along the lower deep he came horribly. Notice how Whitman loves this word in Leaves of Grass, rating us. We closed with him. The yards entangled, okay, so now we've got the two ships fighting, the cannon touched, my captain, obviously, John Paul Jones, lashed fast with his own hands. In other words, in this poem, John, Jones does not run from being the leader. Now, Whitman was enamored of leadership and believed that leadership has everything to do with the success of a democracy. Obviously, his greatest exemplar of this is Lincoln himself. Notice now, very quickly, we'll get the, rendi the rendering of, of the fight. We'd receive some 18-pound shots under the water. Notice how we'll use, e Whitman will use military language as if re the one experiencing this poem, reading this poem, hearing the story, knows what we're talking about. On a lower gun deck, two large pieces had burst at the first fire, killing all around and blowing up overhead. Notice this voice of killing all around does this objectively, right? Lots of people died. Fighting at sundown, fighting at dark is a line that was added after the 55 uh, edition, right? 10 o'clock at night, so notice we're going to be at, we're going to be close to midnight. 10 o'clock at night, the full moon, we're going to obviously come back to the, to the moon, right? 
uh, three times in this poem. Well up, by the way, it was shining in the 55 edition. Our leaks on the gain and five feet of water report. In other words, things are going badly for us. The master at arms, interesting little note here, loosening the prisoners confined in the after hole to give them a chance for themselves, as opposed to, of course, the prisoners of the previous poem who are taken out and routinely executed, right? The transit to and from the magazine, and then all of a sudden, from the past tense in, in the 1855 uh, version, which goes past tense all the way to the end, we now shift to the present tense. This is a subtle kind of thing that Whitman does to make this the rest of the story so much more profound. The transit to and from the magazine is now stopped. By the way, S-T-O-P-P-E-D was the spelling in 55. It's changed to S-T-O-P-T. Trying to capture that American vernacular, right, by the Sentinels. They see so many strange faces, they do not know whom to trust. The chaos, in other words, that's, uh, that's assuming. When we get the drum taps, we're going to hear some of this as well, because Whitman will try to describe the chaos that, of course, uh, um, Crane will describe in Red Badge of Courage as well, another three observation. Our, our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter. Now, of course, the other being the, right, the, 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 the British, goes, um, uh, and obviously asking for surrender if our colors are struck and the fighting done. In other words, are you ready to give up? Now, I laugh content. So you've got the storyteller. So notice, we've got a very similar kind of motif in our study of Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where Marlowe, we've given lectures on this, right? Where Con Conrad's writing about Marlowe telling the story, right? And... Uh, in his quest for Kurtz. And you've got something very similar happening here. Now I laugh content. Notice the word content. For I hear the voice of our, of my little captain. It's interesting, little. John Paul Jones not tall, so what we mean here by little. And then, not italicized in the 55 edition, but italicized here. Notice, we have not struck, he composedly cries, we have just begun our part of the fighting. In other words, we haven't even started our side of this thing yet. In other words, at the moment that it appears absolutely they're going to have to surrender, John Paul Jones is ready to say, no, 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 we haven't even started fighting yet. This story, of course, becoming famous in the American lore among especially those in the military when especially they're caught in situations where it looks hopeless and then they find their way out. Notice, to just prove how bad it is, only three guns are in use, once directed by the captain himself against the enemy's main mass. In other words, notice John Paul Jones is in fact fighting himself. Two well served with grape and canister, again the language of military uh, language, silent his musketry and clear his decks, the tops alone, um, um, second the fire, again the military language, second the fire of this little battery, especially the main top, they hold out bravely during the whole of the action. Notice in passage 34 it was the work when, speak, when spoken of in a derogatory way. Here it's the action, right? Not a moment's cease. Again, trying to capture, creating tension. The leaks gain fast on the pumps. The fire eats, it's interesting verb, toward the power magazine. Of course, when that happens, the ship will explode and it's over. One of the pumps has been shot away. It's generally thought we are sinking. In other words, there is a certain conviction this thing is done, this thing is over. Now, notice how, in, and this happened in our last poem, where we go from the big picture down to a single 17-year-old who's fighting for his life and ultimately dies. Notice here, we got all this other stuff happening, and now Whitman, the storyteller, the poet, will focus the lens down to just John Paul Jones himself, and he begins with the word serene, which he, he, he spoke of Lincoln often as a man who was very serene, confident in the middle of the storm. Serene stands... The little captain. And again, you cannot read these lines without appreciating, oh, captain, my captain, who have been written obviously later. He is not hurried. His voice is neither high nor low. Obviously, voice is everything for Whitman in Leaves of Grass, right? His eyes give more light to us than our battle lanterns. Now, obviously, this is uh, what we call hyperbole or exaggeration, and yet it's beautiful exaggeration. And notice, we go from battle lanterns to the moon in the next line. Toward 12, so we're obviously two hours now into the contest. There in the beams of the moon, for the third time the moon is referenced, they surrender to us. It's interesting that Whitman, who loves his exclamation point, does not end this poem with an exclamation point, right? And yet, obviously, readers of this poem are like, who are at the end of this one? In other words, that just goes to show if you've got the right kind of leader and you've got uh, men and women willing to follow the right kind of leader, we can get out of about anything. Well, obviously at 2A, 
the major messages here are patriotic in nature. Life is obviously about struggle. You gotta face your fears, right? And of course, this idea that we should remember those who have sacrificed and those who have given the ultimate sacrifice. That is to say, we should have a, a respect, a patriotic respect for those who helped to bring about this great thing we call America. At to be, I, I just want to point out, we could say a lot about the alighted version of the stuff. I just want to point out, notice the tense change. There is a shift in the tense from past to present, and the rest of the poem is then in the present tense, capturing, focus that, that intensity. Right. Uh, at 3A, well, I'm going to point out, as I pointed out in the last uh, lecture, that you can't read a set of lines like this without full appreciation of the Iliad and especially the Aeneid, that in both counts will play around with that game of the taunting of the enemy. I mean, think about how many times we see this in the Iliad and the Aeneid, right? Where it looks as if the one side's going to win and they begin to taunt the other side. And of course, the taunting is what ultimately leads to the decision to let's go ahead and finish this thing, and that's exactly what happens. Think about our Beowulf, think about our Mallory and the Epic of Gilgamesh, all these titles that we've studied that will in some ways try to capture the urgency of the moment of heroism in the middle of battle. Finally, since we're on this topic of heroes, who, who are your heroes, right, who have stood serene in the face of danger? And to what degree do you consider yourself capable of that kind of thing? I mean, we've said this before, right? You want to live a life that prepares you for the key moments in your life where true challenges are coming. You will stand next to a hole in the ground, most likely. And somebody you care about is going to get put there. And you're going to have all of those people around you. And the question is, will they be able to rely on you? Or will you fall like, as they say, a cheap suit or a cheap tent? And you won't be a source of strength at all for them. To what degree do you feel that you yourself can stand serene in the middle of catastrophe? and you can take care of others around you. And to what degree is, hopefully, your reading of uh, Whitman's Lisa Grass helping you to do that very thing? Let's come back to passage 36. Thank you.